Welcome to week three of the American Rose Society Virtual Arrangement Seminar. Judging candidates, I hope you are following along with your guidelines as we have indicated where the most important information is found in the manual. We also want to remind you that the text you see in red is something to pay close attention to for your written exam. This outstanding dried mass arrangement was created by Marge Godfrey. You will see many outstanding designs by Marge. If there are any experienced designers who are successful in drying roses and would be willing to teach others, please let us know because that is a skill that many would like to learn. Syllabus for part one today. Chapter seven and nine, craft and personal adornment, dried roses. Chapter 10, backgrounds, underlays, bases, accessories, and features. Here's an example of a unique display of dried roses. It appears to be a small quilt mounted and displayed with a dried arrangement attached. Many artistic components went into this display. This is the time of the year to start practicing drying roses and other materials to be used in these exhibits for the next round of rose shows. Many of us have an abundance of roses now to practice. We need to learn good technique for drying roses and other plant materials. I've tried air drying and also silica gel or silica sand with so-so results. Your goal is to retain the maximum of original qualities of the rose, good color and form. Then when you're putting together your arrangement or display, we need to see quality of workmanship. Your exhibit can never be previously exhibited. They have to be unique for that show. Some rose show schedules have standard or miniature arrangements in the traditional style, also the modern style. These dried arrangements fo follow the guidelines for traditional mass designs. The quality of the workmanship is superb. All the dried roses in these arrangements have also retained the maximum original qualities of color and form. Nancy Reddington shared some photos of her modern designs using dried arrangement, dried roses. Dried rose arrangements can be tricky to transport since they are easily subjected to bumps and damage. Nancy Reddington sent me a quick note and shared this very practical idea for transporting miniature dried arrangements. Rose craft can be many different types of displays. Here are just a few that are mentioned in the guidelines. It could be a wreath, an ornament, a picture frame, that's actually 3D, a box, a picture, or some of the others that you'll see in this presentation. The craft exhibits, the rose craft exhibits are purely decorative items. The perfection of the dried blooms must be featured along with the quality of the workmanship and interpretation of the class theme. They are eligible for a higher award um, if they have won 92 plus points. They could qualify for a rose craft certificate or miniature rose craft certificate, depending on the class and the schedule. When I put out a call for photo using dried roses, many, many friends shared photos. These are so unique 
and I appreciate all the planning and effort that went into making each one. I've wanted to do a wreath. I've often thought that it would be great fall or holiday display, and either one of these two wreaths would be ideal. Here are two examples that use a picture frame with a 3D presentation. <clears throat> I've been to a few national shows where there, where this type of hat is on display. The key here is having dried roses that retain their color and form. The quality of the workmanship and attention to details here is outstanding. I hope this section of photos inspires you to learn more about and try working with dried roses. My mini one on the right was done at a spring district workshop after some instruction. So that's a good idea for a program. Another good activity for a district meeting is a hands-on activity of making personal adornments. I recall doing that one one year at the Pacific Northwest District meeting, learning how to make a boutonniere and corsage and bouquet is a good skill for a rosarian. Plus, you need to be ready to enter this uh, class. I like the way that it's displayed on the Albuquerque show on the right. Chapter 10. Arranging with roses, design components. Plant materials, fresh dried or treated dried. Containers, mechanics, backgrounds and underlays, bases, accessories, features. All branches of the art are governed by the elements of and principles of design. The painter works with a canvas and paint. The architect works with blueprints and computer plotters. The flower arranger works with plant materials, supporting mechanics, and components to create harmonious and beautiful arrangements. Mechanics hold the plant materials together. Commonly used mechanics are floral foam, Kenzons, floral water tubes, and other supports. All designs should be made so that the mechanics are as unobtrusive as possible. In East Asian designs, the Kenzan may be visible, but not distracting. Here are some modern arrangements with no obvious containers. One important thing to remember when you're judging or planning your arrangement is that you should use clean containers. Use containers that are clean when you begin and then use Windex wipe or a soft cloth just before you place the exhibit. That way you'll get maximum distinction points. It shows you took a little extra effort. You need good roses in your arrangement. Good horticultural practices will produce roses that are of superior quality that have increased substance. This will give you better performance, whether you're using them in an arrangement, in a show, in your home, church, or office. Floral foam. Usually it's green for wet or fresh flower arrangements. Um, I have seen a different color and a different texture for dried arrangements. Although I think you could probably use that same foam that we use for wet, just don't wet it up. There are several sizes of Kenzans and several sizes of orchid picks. Background. Background is the surface or scene behind the arrangement. A niche background will enclose it will enclose the sides and is part of the arrangement both niche niche and niche 
are correct pronunciations and mean the same thing. Freestanding backgrounds may be provided by the arranger or by the show committee and may not exceed the allowable height, width, and depth, which must be stated in the show schedule. Notice how the addition of the background focuses your eye on the arrangement and you don't get distracted by the windows in the background. This is a good exercise to do to evaluate your design and background. The influence of the background is considered in judging the arrangement and a background that is untidy or otherwise distracting might be penalized under distinction according to the degree of distraction. These photos show an exercise where various colors were used as backgrounds. Notice that the base and underlayment or lack thereof has changed in each photo. Photography is your friend when it comes to arrangements because you can photograph and review and change things before exhibiting. These photos were taken by me at a North Central District workshop in the early days of digital photography, not the greatest photos, but if you look closely, you will understand that they are different versions of the same arrangement. The one that I think is most effective is the one that I put in the center. It has a nice red background and an underlayment. Um, the one on the top left you'll see has no underlayment and a different color. Same thing with the blue background. And the red on the right hand side bottom shows you where it, an underlayment black and a base has been added. So you can try these different things out and see which one you think works best. As I said, I like the one, I like the version in the center. I think it's the most effective. Underlays. Underlays are any material, fabric, paper, or plastic that is placed under the arrangement or on the table on which the arrangement stands. An underlay should not be confused with a base. An underlayment is something placed ahead or plan, excuse me, an underlayment is something planned ahead by the designer to define the space of the arrangement. Bruce shared this photo during his discussion of modern designs, but it deserves a second examination. Notice how the continuation of the backer board extends forward to be an underlay. It appears that the bases under the roses are similarly covered with the same material. The roses are placed to show a blotch of color within this setting. Bases are anything placed under the arrangement. Usually it lifts it up a bit. If present, they are considered part of the overall arrangement. They may add weight and stability, plus they may add contrast in color or texture. Accessories. This miniature line design is a winner in my eyes. The proportion and scale of this miniature arrangement is very good. I find the creative creativity and expressiveness also very good. Notice the roses are dominant, but the well-chosen accessories and underlayment help the viewer understand the class title of pot of gold. The size of any accessory should complement and not dominate. Features, outdoor roses must dominate and be the feature of the arrangement. Again, I would like to thank the following friends for sending photographs for my week two and week three programs. Next, Bruce will continue with today's program. Thank you, Elena. This week in part two of our presentation, we'll be looking at chapter 14, East Asian arrangements, their history and background. Chapter five, judging East Asian arrangements. Chapter 19, responsibilities of arrangement judges. And finally, chapter 20, 
training and accrediting rose arrangement judges. We're going to start with chapter 14 to take a look at where East Asian arrangements come from and some basic concepts. First up, let's discuss the idea that there are three primary countries represented in East Asian. Their history is intertwined through conquer, as well as religious, social, political, and artistic exchanges. We'll start first with China. The floral expressions of the Chinese have traditionally been based on the Confucian art of contemplation, the Buddhist principle of preservation, and Taoist symbolism. Chinese arrangements are placed in an, in an ornate porcelain, bronze, or pewter container, which are making the arrangement large and made with few varieties of plant material, as seen here. In traditional flower arranging, there are four basic forms to create a perfectly balanced arrangement. The upright, seen on the left, the tilt, the horizontal, and the drooping. There are also three basic principles. Follow nature, learn from nature, and present nature in a better way. The example on the right is more of a modern versus traditional form, and is presenting nature in a better way. In comparison, the differences between Chinese and Japanese design styles, which we'll see in a moment, Chinese arrangements are less carefully planned and stylized than those of the Japanese. We'll look at Korea next. Their art form of floral arranging is known as kokoji or kothkoji. The flowers, stalks, and branches are arranged that complement each other in a triangle with a main stem, a secondary stem, and a tertiary stem. There are three main styles in Korean flower arrangement, the upright, seen on the right, the slanting style, and the hanging style. So we see a combination on the left of the slanting and hanging style. Next, we'll look at Japan. Essentially, Ikebana started out as the expression, the Japanese art of floral arranging with its roots in the realm of Buddhist temple offerings of flowers in the sixth century. The Ikinobo school of Ikebana was formalized in the 15th century with strict rules and very formalized arrangements. This is the Rika style, which comes from that period. Each stem in the design has significance. On the far left side, we see an artist interpretation of a Rika design, a very traditional Rika design in the middle, and a modern one material Rika in the other. You'll see in each of the three, the space between the start of the leaves and flowers compared to the container is an open space where all stems are gathered in one location. That is called the Mizugiwa, meaning the water's edge. And it gives a height to the design, but also strength. These types of designs were used in uh, traditional Buddhist temples and Japanese offerings, and the common people were not involved with this type of work. So a new style was developed called Seika or Shoka. It's a more simplified form of the Rika, and it was developed for use in the home in a tokonoma, which is a niche in the wall of a building where it can hold artwork, whether ceramic, a scroll, or ikibana. When viewed from about three feet away, it takes on the form of a living painting. Here we have some very formalized shoka. Again, you'll see that spot where all the stems seem to come from one position. Materials are gracefully arranged on the right-hand side, all for Scythia, but still gathered in the same location. The Shoka style began to evolve into the Nagere, where a tall container is used 
and material is arranged in a variety of ways. In 1895, the O'Hara School was started, formalized in 1916. It began in order to include floral material that was coming into Japan after the opening of trade with the West. O'Hara School emphasizes seasonal qualities, natural growth processes, and the beauty of natural environments. The O'Hara School believes that it is important for its students to observe nature. It supported the departure from previous Ikebana by the creation of the new form called the Morabana style. This style later evolved into the school's landscape arrangement. So here we see water showing, a very common design style called for in our ARS rose shows. And on the right-hand side, more of an upright form in a container. So uh, the O'Hara School works with both of these. In 1927, Sofu Teshigahara began the Sugetsu School. He felt that the strict rules surrounding Ikebana were too constraining and limited personal expression. Anytime, anywhere, by anyone, with any materials, is the creed of the Sugetsu school. Here we see two examples. Sugetsu Ikebana is popular around the world as a school of Ikebana that draws out the freedom of expression in each individual, always new, always beautiful, and never constrained by preconceptions. So you notice the styles are very different from what Rico is showing, Shoko is showing, as well as Morabana. Following World War II, the US diplomats, GIs, and their wives were stationed in Japan and became interested in the Ikebana floral art form. When returning to the United States, the Ikebana International Chapter Number no. One was started in Washington, D.C. in 1956. The love of nature is intrinsic to Japanese culture. From earliest time, homes were open to nature, sliding doors into courtyards, as you see in this picture. An enclosed garden was designed to recreate the grandeur of nature, but miniaturized. Shinto the indigenous spirituality of Japan is often called nature worship. Buddhism, also prevalent in Japan, is based on the laws of nature and is compatible with Shinto. In these spiritual realms, life and death occur, all is ephemeral. Ikebana, the floral art form, once created, begins to deteriorate and is short-lived. Ikebana arrangements are expected to establish a link between man and nature, but also to create a mood appropriate to the season or the occasion. Understanding this Japanese aesthetic is critical in the successful completion of Ikebana, in the judging of ARS East Asian arrangements, and in the general appreciation of the art form itself. I would suggest you search down copies of Monty Don, the English gardener and TV host, two-part program on a Westerner learning to appreciate the historical and modern Japanese gardens. It's a great intro to this discipline. So check out this program on the various streaming services. Ma is a concept in Japan that permeates life and art in that culture. You'll see that Ma is represented with a combination of the symbols for door and sun. When placed together, these two characters depict a door through which the sun is coming through a crevice, peeping into the interior space. Well, what does this do? It allows the person in the room or building to be able to see more within their surroundings inside the building, but it also allows a peek to the outside. Each case, seeing what is there and what is possible to be there. You'll notice in this design, there's a great deal of space 
of rhythm, of color. So the Japanese concept of ma permeates life and art in that culture. It's a space and an essential component and often the focal point of an arrangement. It is viewed as invisible energy that gives life to the form. Space is sculpted by careful placement of materials. And when we step back to observe an arrangement, we feel the interplay between space and form. And Ikebana reminds us to slow down, to shape our time and space, not with things, but with feeling. In Japan, this is done through exhibitions of Ikebana. People come through, they stop, they view, they interpret, they put themselves in the design and they appreciate the design. And at no time are these exhibitions judged. The ARS, however, includes schedules for East Asian arrangements, which will be judged. Therefore, guidelines were formulated by which judges may determine the degree to which an arrangement conforms. As judges, we must both look at the degree to which the arrangement conforms, but also interpret the emotional impact the arranger is revealing to us. The three main schools, Ihinobo, Ohara, Sagetsu, vary greatly in the amount of material used and the manner in which that material is handled or treated. You may encounter an entry done in a Sagetsu style and yet have to evaluate it in terms of the Ikinobo standards as seen in the guidelines. Therefore, becoming familiar with all three school styles is important and as judges, giving the designer the benefit of any doubt. We look at the principles of East Asian design that we have talked about before, balance. There is both the physical and visual stability, which should be evident, and the consideration of ma, the energy that's within that design, the spaces allowing you to enter the design. Dominance must be in the roses. The contrast is really the arranger's prerogative, whether it's textures of the floral material, the colors of the floral material, all of that is there to interpret the theme of the design or person's interpretation of the design. For rhythm, in traditional East Asian, we look for a scaling triangle being evident. We'll talk about that in a moment. They should appear in the Moribana and Nagare style. In freestyle, however, it is not necessary and can be quite modern in its interpretation. That same kind of rhythm. Proportion and scale are based on relationship of the three main stems, the shin, so, and tai. But the entire design need not fill the space allocated within the show. Let's take a look at those three main stems. Working across the top, shin represents heaven in the design, and it's usually upright, leaning to the rear. Mathematically speaking, you take the height plus the width of the container times two, and you will have the height of that stem arising out of the container. So is representing earth, it comes forward to either side of the shin, and it's approximately three quarters of the shin. Tai represents man, which is close to the base and usually opposite of soy and being approximately one half the length of the shin, the most upright of the steps. So I are any of the helping pieces that fill up the design and they visually and physically support the shin, so and tie in the design. We talk about scaling triangles, they are asymmetrical. You see them in two dimensions, but you have to imagine them in three. They can tip forward, back, left, or right, but they should be evident with shin, so, and tai. On the left is an arrangement entered in one of the shows that I judged, and you can see the scaling triangle 
blooming from purple to purple to purple. The rose looks a little bit to the left and the other material begins to support that design. Afterwards, I was talking with that particular arranger and we decided to play a little bit with the design. What happens if you move that triangle around? Does it have a different feeling? Can you enter it in a different way? So you see the same materials, nothing was shortened, everything was used in a different way. And it takes on an entirely different perspective in this particular design. There's various equipment that we use in East Asian designs. Look at containers first. Below, with water showing, the low container is called the suban, and it is used in Morabana. Three examples of containers for Morabana. Some have rims, some do not. Three examples from Roshos of Morabana examples. In the left, we see four pink roses that dominate this particular design. Is the shin the uh, plastic chopsticks in the back? Is it the larger green stem? Where is so? Where is Thai? You may not have the same impression as the designer. Be careful. Again, the benefit of the doubt goes to the designer. What it is really not called for here is the use of four roses. Four is a number that the Japanese avoid. And in East Asian design of this style, one should also avoid that preferring odd number of roses. On the far right hand side, we see one branch of uh, this lily that's been used. And it really has two pieces there that form different stems. Would one be sufficient or is two necessary? Are they too heavy for the design? Do they balance out the, the shorter stems appropriately? In the middle, we see the stems placed relatively near to the roses and they help support and are truly asherai in this case. The placement of the Kenzan in the container may also convey meaning. For designs that reflect springtime or summer, the Kenzan is usually placed to the back of the container, exposing more water, allowing a cooling effect. If it's a winter or fall type of design, we'd want to move the Kenzan to the front of the container thereby hiding the water, less cooling, more like those particular seasons. A medium container is used in shoka. And it features that Mizugawa, again, holding the floor material up. Let's take a look at the kinds of containers here. You can find some at craft shows. You can pay a lot of money for a shulker container, or they're even available in plastic in, in some uh, wholesalers. So look around what might be possible here. A couple of examples, both of which have basically the same problems as I see as a judge. Uh, the shin stem seems to be a bit long compared to the sizes of the containers. The material in the middle should probably have a little more space between them to show more of the floral material. And we're lacking the Mizugiwa at the base, separating the floral material from the container. So we shouldn't have even number of roses in a design. The one on the right has a third rose toward the back, giving depth and a color form to that particular design. 12 containers are used in Nagari. And there is quite a range of those containers. They oftentimes have interesting texture to them, color and pattern, which can be used to your advantage. Nagari here on the left, the shin should be the large drooping stem to the left 
which would be approximately the appropriate height. Here again, we have four roses, which may not be the most desirable in this particular case if it's a traditional Nagayare in design. In the center, you see four roses very clearly, but there is a fifth toward the back in the center, right above the uh, container that is obscured by the pine. Again, you're looking through that design. Excuse me, my, my uh, slides are popping around here and not behaving. There we go. Uh, there is that space between the roses and the pine, at the top right, which gives that space that uh, would help us with ma. And the right hand side, we see that material is fairly well balanced, but they are grouped by the nature of their material there. So an interesting way to approach it. And then you have some special containers which can be used in freestyle. Quite a range here. Uh, there is a large opening on the far right brown. Uh, there are two openings in the center silver one. And here we can get some very bright colors going in freestyle. One very interesting opening on the far left. And in the front, we just have one opening, but it can be used in a very inventive way. In freestyle, also known as Jiyuka, uh, there's no specific rule, but represents the self-expression of the arranger within that East Asian aesthetic. They can be naturalistic or they can be abstract, and they may include man-made material. Uh, these first two don't represent things in a rose show, but give interesting idea to how space is used and focus is used within your freestyle arrangement. Uh, oftentimes we look at color blocking in freestyle arrangement. And here we have three blobs of red rising out of the container. The space in between is punctuated by all the rods. On the left, the monstera leaf, very strong. The uh, brown leaf going out to the far right, strong color and reflective quality of that. And the bamboo being split gives a nice texture to that as well. Very interesting design in the freestyle form. And in row shows, on the far left, the curling material, which would be man-made in a sense, uh, contrasts the natural material especially, but it reflects the staghorn's curling, and uh, it's a very nice design. Uh, in the middle, very tall container. Again, the color blocking of the roses in the center, as well as at the top of the design, those balls of color keep the same shape, different color, more in, more lightly uh, placed there. And on the far right, we see what could be a modern design as well. And that is very true. Freestyle is a modern form of Ikebana, and the two are related very nicely. We see multiple uh, points of emergence in this particular container. We have some uh, abstraction with the curling of the brown leaves and the placement giving a mass of color rather than distinctly individual roses. The Kenzan, as Helena pointed out, uh, need not be concealed within your Moribonic containers. And a Kenzan means needle mountain. And there are many styles of Kenzan coming in many materials, plastic, typically a lead base with the brass uh, needles within them. They come in different weights, different dimensions of the size. Uh, some come in two parts, three parts are interconnected for various effects. Uh, plastic used in more clear containers, all are possible, all are available. On the far right, the Kenzan cup becomes a nice way to add an additional placement in your East Asian design, but also very nice to use in modern designs as it's small, it's rather uh, black with a disappearing color, it will disappear within your design, it can be used to great effect. So Kenzan are a wonderful thing. A kubari is used in Nagare to brace the stems. It's something that you create within the container, and here's what it looks like. Two stems crisscrossed up against the sides of the container. Now, a good uh, Ikebana instructor will have you make one of these things and then the instructor will try to lift the entire heavy container with one finger under those 
two cross stems. If it holds, you've done a good job. You can use this to segment your flowers into particular areas, stressing one side of the container versus the other, and it lends good support within your design. So a couple of general comments here. In Ikebana, there is a restraint in use of plant material in most designs by trimming the excess plant material, getting rid of extra leaf sets. So you open up and see the important dominant features within your design. This is not necessarily a part of Sagetsu and should be recognized as not part of that school. But in a Sagetsu design, you're going to see much more material as we noticed before. And Ikebana will present a scenic landscape, that open courtyard when viewed from the front. You're looking to see natural things happening within your design. And finally, stems and leaves should not touch the lip of the low container for Morvana. And again, we'll use an odd number of roses within your design. More to read about the history and background of the various styles in your guidelines, be sure to do that and become more familiar with it. Some resources for you. Shoso Sato has written any number of books and he's an excellent Ikebana master. The one on the far left is his original text back in the late uh, 19, early, well, maybe early 90s, I believe. Uh, he updated it with more modern things and new ways of looking at Ikebana in 2008 with his volume in the middle, The Art of Arranging Flowers. And he produced this on the far right hand, Asian Arts and Crafts for Children. Don't consider this a baby book. It's a great place to enter into the world of learning about Ikebana and practicing those skills. Lessons are given, demonstrations are given in that as well. So all three books are available readily on eBay. Uh, some are still available, for instance, on Barnes and Noble. Uh, Ikebana in the middle, the art of arranging flowers comes in a hardback or soft cover. Also be aware that there are a lot of YouTube videos about arranging in the Ikebana style. A lot of Japanese masters have uh, recorded things and presented them. Uh, you can learn very basic styles, very basic patterns, and uh, become more familiar with Ikebana in that way. Also by going to ikebanainternationalheadquarters.org, uh, you can learn more about the history there. You will see uh, buttons for the various schools, uh, Ichio, Ikinobo, Ohara, and Sagetsu, just to name a few of them. Currently, there are over 3,000 distinct schools of study of Ikebana in the world, many more than we can ever know about as judges for the American Rose Society. There are, however, 59 United States chapters that have links, many of them have links on this particular website where you can get information about where they meet, most metropolitan areas around the country, major metropolitan areas, and they are more than willing to have you come in and view lessons, even take lessons with them. So use those resources to learn more about East Asian design for the American Rose Society. Next, we're going to take a look at Chapter 19, the responsibilities of arrangement judges. I've broken this into three areas. And uh, first is just to sign in on as the arrangement chair for your local show. Your responsibilities would be to invite judges to your show, provide them with the show schedule, and act as that contact person before or during the show as a point of information and clarification that they may need to create a successful judging experience. If you are asked to judge, make sure you review the show schedule prior to your arrival in your judging location. Dress appropriately. Wear your judge badge as identification. You earned it. You should identify yourself as a certified American Rose Society judge. We recommend that you survey the entire show prior to any judging so that you have a sense of the degree of skill level within that group of people and where the emphasis may be in that show. Try to exhibit in the judges section. Bring roses and a perhaps disposable container with you that uh, you could then enter something in their show and work with apprentice judges is very important. Make sure you discuss as you judge along in the show. Ask for their opinion. See how well they understand the guidelines for that particular class of roses and rose design. 
give feedback on their performance. You're going to complete and submit the evaluation forms, but I would strongly recommend that you as a judge photograph what you have written in case there's any question or um, misplaced judging forms. And also make sure that the apprentice judge has a copy of that as well, so they can understand better what you have said, where they are excelling, where they need to improve. Make sure that you give that complete evaluation to them. And finally, keep up to date with the guidelines and any changes that may occur in them. Present programs at your local and district levels and assist with the arrangement sections of any ARS show, whether local, district, or national. Let's take a look at the very last chapter for this particular group of sessions, training and accrediting. For those people who are going for their judging certification, you need to make sure of all of these points. For the preparation and training to be an American Rose Society arrangement judge, you should be carefully reading and studying your guidelines become increasingly familiar every time you do. If you have an unclear point, go back and reread. Practice those different arrangement styles. Attend the flower arranging courses, no matter where they're given. Find an East Asian exhibit or schools, chapters, whatever, and participate in their courses and exhibits. Exhibit in shows. More practice makes you a better judge. Clerk at Rose shows as well to learn more about the horticultural side as well as the arrangement side. Maintain a productive rose garden so you have something to work with. Read books and articles on arranging and attend rose arrangement seminars that you may have within your district or region, any workshops, and as this is, a judging school. To become an American Rose Society arrangement judge, you must hold membership in the ARS for 24 months, 12 months of which must be immediately preceding becoming an apprentice Rose arrangement judge. By attending these three sessions, you have attended your Rose arrangement judge in school. You need to pass the ARS horticultural judge examination prior to passing your arrangement judge exam. That's preferable or you are allowed to do it during the 12 month period following notification of passing your arrangement judge exam. You must present evidence, whether an entry tag or ribbon marked with the class, the division, your score, and the judge's signature of at least three arrangements scoring 90 or more points in three different arrangement divisions traditional, modern, East Asian, Rosecraft, personal adornment, anything is possible, but they must occur in at least two different shows. And you must apprentice at least five shows within a three year period. To maintain your status as an arrangement judge, when you have finalized all of your work that preceding or for those people who are currently an arrangement judge, you must hold continuous membership in the ARS. You have to judge in at least three ARS shows during a four year period. You must enter arrangements in at least two different shows in the four year period, open class or judges class. You need to record four credit hours of approved ARS seminars or workshops or judging schools at least once every four years. Some credit can be earned by attending approved online seminars such as this, but the four hours must include attendance at an in-person activity where there's a discussion of arrangements and that whole thing must last more than an hour. And finally, you must report your judging activities to your district arrangement chair when requested. So thank you very much, everyone, for attending this virtual arrangement school. We thank you for being here, for uh, listening carefully. We look forward to answering any questions you might have this week. Thank you very much.